Okay, so let's talk about quiz C. After reading this paragraph, what are the subjects for this scenario? What are the subjects? Very good. So, but you want to be specific, Jarvis. These specific 90 volunteers with higher than average blood pressure. Okay, what treatments could these volunteers be receiving? What treatments? Okay, so 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams, or the placebo. So 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams, or the placebo, which hopefully all of these look exactly the same. What do you care about? What are you writing down at the end of this study? The blood pressure. The blood pressure. And hopefully, it's a decrease, right? Hopefully, we're hoping for, fingers crossed, a decrease in blood pressure. Okay, any questions so far kind of on the specifics here, vocab, stuff like that? No, it'd be okay. Good. Yes, Catherine. So I think it was David mentioned that it would be best to look at the change in weight loss by percentage. That way, if you look at just total decrease in blood pressure, you might have someone who has a, a larger decrease, but maybe that's because their blood pressure was much higher. So do we put percent? If you'd like, yes, you can. All right. I mean, ultimately, it's just asking what are you writing down. You're writing down their blood pressure. How you want to analyze that change is up to you. Good question. All right, let's talk about number four. What would be an advantage to randomly assigning these treatments? Right. We have 90 volunteers. And we have three different treatments, so we should randomly assign 30 to be in each group. And I told you guys uh, yesterday with the dogs, it's as easy as just writing down some kind of number or name associated with these people, putting into a big tub, mixing it up, and pulling out their names one at a time. So what, what is something that we talked about yesterday in the lecture that is a benefit to randomly assigning treatments? What's a benefit to using random assignment of treatments? Anybody remember? Yes, you definitely don't want to have any issues with bias. So you can say that. But there's a key kind of phrase or words that I like to use when I talk about random assignments. Okay? What do you guys know? I'm not in the medical field. Some of you might work in the medical field or be interested in going into medicine. What are factors that cause someone to have high blood pressure? Diet. Diet. Genetics. Genetics. Jarvis is the only person. Stress. <laughs> Environment. Right. I don't know, right? Sounds good. Sounds like you know what you're talking about. Sleep. Okay. Do we know all of that about these patients, about these volunteers? No. Exactly. So what the phrase that I like to use Exactly. It mitigates or evens out. We'll use evens out. So it evens out unknown factors that could impact our results. Right? I mean, think about stress causing blood pressure to go up. Right? Do we know the occupations? For these 90 people? No. no. And people might have high stress, low stress jobs. You're going to find out that when you guys have your job, sometimes you have low stress periods, right? And then high stress periods. Okay? So we don't know what's going on in their lives that could affect the blood pressure results. Yes? Yes, yes, it always is. Always is. Why do you say no? That's different than random assignment. 
we're going to talk about six. Let's come to six. Go back to you. Yes. Michelle. Okay, hold on, hold on. Now you're talking about a different thing there. You just threw something, just like casually just mentioned something. You're talking about blocking. If you're talking about grouping based on diabetic or not, now you're talking about basically running two experiments, looking at three different groups with the people that have diabetes and three groups of people that don't have diabetes. Well, well, isn't that one other one that you get at the end of the random? Because that would be full randomly. If you think that having diabetes is going to affect this that much, then you want to ask people, are you diabetic? And then you're going to basically, like I said, run two experiments with a group of people that have diabetes and those that don't. I don't know what you're saying. You try again? No, no. What are you trying? I'll, I'm trying. So I think what you guys are trying to say is we're asking for volunteers, specifically volunteers that have what? High blood pressure, right? Do I want people that have below average blood pressure for this? No. So random assignment and getting people that have the sickness, whatever you want to call it, are different things, right? If I'm testing out a new drug that's going to cure something, I don't want people that don't have it. Right? I want people that have the sickness or illness. No, I don't want to do that, right? But then when you say that, saying specifically that only people that have this can participate, isn't that not random anymore? Because then you, you specify in the population, I only want to test these people. Yes, but why would you want to test someone who doesn't have it? But then that's not random though. Well, you can randomly assign them the different treatments. My brain sees them as two separate things. I'm trying to get you to see that you're asking about two separate things, not the same thing, right? What you guys are asking is really good questions, right? When you sample from a population, you're not doing anything like that. You want everyone. But when you are trying to specifically look at treating something, you want people that are afflicted with that illness only, right? I don't want someone to go through this if they don't have higher than average blood pressure. No, you don't have to say I get it. It's all good. But then the thing is, how do you know? You have to know these people have high blood pressure. Correct. Okay, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about randomly getting 90 people. I'm talking about randomly assigning those 90 people to treatments. It's always beneficial to randomly assign treatments. It's not necessarily always beneficial to just get random people. Is that what you're saying? That's what. And that's not what I'm saying. That's what you're saying. I get the treatment part. Yes. Yeah. So should we answer six since you're asking about it? Yeah. Let's answer six and then we'll come back to you. So to answer to six, and a disadvantage of using volunteers is that your results and conclusions can only be applied to the participants or people similar. Right, so I can't say this works for everyone, which is not helpful, right? We want, if we want it to work, we want it to work for everyone. So that's where, remember uh, yesterday I used the word replicate? You would try to replicate your results with different people, maybe Jarvis with people that don't have high blood pressure. Okay, yes, back to Michelle. I was trying to say, like, what you said earlier, like, let's say somebody who had high blood pressure because of diabetes, okay. Or A placebo, yeah. And like, let's say you all the people who have diabetes and uh -huh. they don't need for a hundred months. That wouldn't be an event. That wouldn't make it, that wouldn't make randomization the best. Again, okay, so I see what you're saying, right? You're saying the, the odds of one characteristic having effect on our results and all those people with the same characteristic being in the same group, yes, that would be unlucky. <laughs> Right? But to say that it doesn't always benefit, it still benefits because there are other things out there like stress, diet, that were evened out. Okay? So that's why if you think, again, if you think diabetes has that much of an issue, shh, if you think that has that much of, of a connection with this, you should separate into two separate experiments. People check the box with diabetes, people say no, then you separate. Let me, can I go a little further?
Is that okay? So let's say you have 45 people that are diabetic, okay? And 45 that are not, all right? You would run three different groups for this one. So 100, 200 milligrams placebo, so 15 in each. You'd randomly assign 15 in each for this. So like, it's, like I said, it's like you're trying two separate experiments. That's called blocking. Now, what usually happens, Michelle, is that when you do this in real life, you look at your results, and you're like, man, what is going on with that group? And then they drill down and look at their, you know, their questions that they ask them and realize, oh my gosh, two thirds of this group has diabetes. Maybe that was causing an issue with our blood pressure. And then we do it again and block by diabetes. That's usually how it works. Okay, questions? Is that, is that okay? Okay. Let's do five, because we skip five. What's an advantage for a placebo? A control, right? The first thing I think of when I think of a placebo is a control group, a baseline. Right? That's really what you're comparing to. You're comparing the 100 milligram, the 200 milligram to a group of people that are getting no medicine. Okay, in theory, they're getting no medicine in their body to help lower their blood pressure. All right, so some of those people will have lower blood pressure at the end of this because of a number of things. All right, but we always want to have a control group, if possible, right? If possible, you can't always have it, but it's usually best if you have one. Placebos help with that. Okay, is the study blind or could it be blind? Yes. Okay, say more. Uh, they can be one side like, they single blind. Yeah, which okay, so if the volunteers are not told, this is randomly assigned. then it could be single blind. But you can still randomly assign and then tell them you've been randomly assigned to the placebo. Right? That kind of defeats the purpose of having a placebo. You don't want to tell someone they're not getting medicine. <laughs> Well, all these 90 people, they sign up, they fill out, I'm sure they sign 8,000 pages of documents, and they're basically saying, I agree to consent to the study to get medicine. And in there, it will tell them, your medicine might not be medicine. Like, everyone who's in something like this knows that there is a chance they're not getting medicine. So what are they getting? Like sugar. sugar. Yeah, you feel great. What if you're like diabetic? Well, again, if you think <laughs> we're back to the diabetes. Again, if you think that's a problem, they would disclose that in their medical information. What about no, I'm talking about like diabetic studies. Like what do they do? I have no idea. I feel like this is what a great opportunity to use Google. Yes. What did I write? Something. Told? On top. People? Similar? Participants. I have very great handwriting. Participants. So how can it be double? So that's, okay, so Catherine's ready to come back. Great, excellent. So I think, I think we all would be pretty confident that it's single blind at least because the patients, the volunteers don't know what medicine they've received. But how can we make sure it's double blind? The doctors do. Okay, doctor, but even more than that, it's like the doctors give them, they don't they might not know. But then how are they gonna the one who's the people running it? Right? Maybe it's also doctors, I don't know. Yes, the people so analyzing the data. You to be double blind, to be double blind, I mean it's really everyone. All right, and that includes those evaluating results. Someone knows, right? Someone knows. So like the way I view it, the way I view it is like this, Captain. I, I am, my company wants to do this. Not my, so I work for a company that wants to do this, okay? I have been tasked with completing this whole thing, okay? So I hire, 10 people, all right, okay, 22 people, okay. I hire a number of people 
to go out and find 90 people that we want to use for this, okay? Then I also make phone calls to eight physicians, okay? Then I also make a phone call to 10 people to analyze the results. So I know, but I'm not in charge of analyzing the data at the end, all right? I hire someone else, like another company, exactly, and they tell me the results, and then I say, oh, look at that. You told me the 100 milligram group, we'll call it group A, you told me group A showed the largest decrease percentage-wise in blood pressure. That was the 100 milligram. So at the end, after we conclude this group showed the best results, then we can like you know move the curtain back and see which treatment it was. Yes, but I get paid the most amount of money, right? It's my made-up scenario. I have no idea. Oh, you get the most made-up scenario? Always, right? You don't in yours? No. So okay. Correct, right? You might even be told you're in group A. Uh -huh. But you don't know what that means. Remember, you've signed something that tells you what all of this means, right? It takes, like with my father's experience, it takes a months to get approved for this. Paperwork. Yes, a lot of paperwork, a lot of doctor's so appointments, a lot of like, be basically like weeding you out because they, it's, with this kind of stuff, I know this seems pretty generic, usually with these drug trials, it's super specific who they want. Super specific. Okay. Oh, I would hope that my father's trial is double blind. Yes. But I was asking about like, the double blind, like, those, evaluated, those evaluating the results would know that the like Correct. Probably. They would probably be given, here's group A, analyze those results. Here's group B, analyze them. Here's group C, now compare them. They'd probably be given everything except for group A means this treatment. Yes? Well, it could be, usually I, okay, again, you, I'm stepping very much out of my realm of expertise. Um, a lot of times it's a combination. Right? A lot of times you'll have governments fund these trials. All right? Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's funded. Sometimes it's funded by individuals or groups. All right? But ultimately, the hope is, is that no matter what happens, if it's a positive thing, you want to replicate it. Right? You've got to do it many times. All right? Like think about every time, I don't know how often you guys think about this because you're young, but think about in your lifetime how many times you see a new vaccine has come out, right? I mean, for a while there was a big boom in vaccines. There was like a period of not much. Right now my kids get the chickenpox vaccine. That was not a thing when I was a kid. You did not get a shot to avoid having the chickenpox. You just got the chickenpox and then you were immune, all right? So that happened and that was funded by someone. And now someone makes a ton of money because they produce that vaccine. Is there a chicken pop party? Like, yeah, like when my when I got it, my little brother who was five years younger than me, they my parents were like, okay, Will, go hang out with Douglas. Make sure you get it. And we did. We both, I mean, I had it and he got it. Yes. Say it again. Yeah, no, so no vaccine is 100%, right? The idea is, like, my children get, like, if you think about the hepatitis B shot, right? That shot you get three times, so that way they, the doctors will tell you is your first shot, 85% chance you're not going to get it. Your second one, 95%. Your third one, 99% likely you're not going to get it. They can't tell you you're not going to get it for sure. Right. That's why when you see the stories in like our city and other cities around the country that have issues of like the measles outbreak, like there's been a rise in that because people are not getting that shot. And so kids are getting it. And it was not a thing 10, 15 years ago. Uh, Say it again. I'm going to go ahead and stop this because we're